last year I was teaching a course on goodwill. And one of the issues that came up was a teaching you hear sometimes, which is that the practice of goodwill is a complete practice. It'll take you all the way to awakening. I pointed out that that was not the case. The practice of goodwill has to be based on developing a lot of qualities. Being virtuous, being harmless, being easy to support, not having lots of projects that are going to involve seeing other people as means to finishing your projects. being easy to teach. Then you practice goodwill. You don't have to wait till everything is perfect, but you have to practice goodwill in the context of a life that's in concordance with goodwill. You can bring the mind to fairly deep states of concentration with the practice of goodwill, even deeper states with equanimity, and then you have to analyze them. One, use the power of your concentration to look at your fascination with sensual pleasures. See why is it that you go for those things. See what the allure is, see what the drawbacks are, and then see that there's an escape. Seeing the escape and taking the escape, that's the duty of wisdom or discernment. So goodwill can play a large role in the practice, but it's not everything. One of the people in the Course commented afterwards that, well, I guess goodwill is a complete practice, but it needs some other things as well. Everybody in the room laughed. It's like saying that rice is a complete dinner as long as you add other things to it. But it is an important part of the practice, and it's very central. There was a book one time, a survey of early Buddhist teachings that organized everything under the Four Noble Truths, and then at the very end tacked on the Brahma Viharas, as if it was somehow not integral to the practice. That's kind of, he said, the, <clears throat> the author said it was the social dimension of Buddhism where everything else was totally devoted to the training of your mind as if you could separate the two. One of the reasons we practice is we look at our lives, we look at our desire for happiness, but then we also turn around and look at how much harm our desire for happiness can, can cause, both for ourselves and for other people, if we're not careful, if we're not skillful. And so one of our underlying motivations for practice, one of the reasons we're here, It's because we're looking for happiness that's harmless, a happiness that will be reliable, and the happiness of nirvana is something really special. The path itself is relatively harmless, but nirvana is totally harmless. It doesn't need to feed on anything. When you're on the path, you have to feed physically and you have to feed your mind. And you take lots of care. So there is some extent to which you're a burden on other people. But you try to be as unburdensome as possible. This is one of the ways in which you show goodwill. And there are other teachings that are related as well. There's that set of teachings that John Sawat liked to comment on again and again, which was the traditions of the Noble Ones, or the customs of the Noble Ones. There are four altogether, and the first three have to do with contentment, being content with whatever food you get, whatever clothing you get, whatever shelter you get, learning how to use these things for their proper purpose, learning how, interestingly enough, not to be proud of the fact that you are content with little. In other words, you realize that even in contentment there's a potential for for pride that you have to watch out for. And then train yourself so you can get to the point where you don't need food, clothing, or shelter for your happiness. 
That's what the fourth tradition is, which is delighting in developing, delighting in abandoning. In other words, you take delight in developing skillful qualities and you take delight in abandoning unskillful ones. This is how you make progress along the path. So when things are difficult, you figure out some way of making them lighter. Encouraging yourself to be up for whatever the difficulties may be. You read a John Mahabhu and he talks about having a fighting spirit. And John Munn's comment that the soldier in the practice is this determination never to come back and be the laughing stock of the defilements ever again. And John Lee talks about the skill of being a, a warrior in which you can actually convert the enemy to your side. So there's some battling that has to be done, but there also has to be a, a willingness on your part to create the spirit of a warrior. And again, this is all for the purpose of that expression of goodwill. We're not just saying, okay, may you forever be well, and think that somehow that statement is magically going to make everything all right. We remind ourselves of these principles because we want them to underlie all of our actions. And so metta has its difficult side as well, because you have to be very scrupulous, very thoughtful in how you deal with yourself and with other people. It's often thought of as a nice feel-good kind of practice, and it does create that energy of feeling good about yourself, that you don't have any evil intentions toward anyone. You're not out there trying to get revenge. You're not trying to straighten everybody else out. If there's anything you can help in straightening them, helping themselves straighten themselves out, so much the better. But if there's nothing, well, that's when you practice equanimity. Recently I heard a senior monk make some very snide remarks about goodwill practices. And he said, do you think this is going to make a real difference when, when there's war or there's evil people out there? We have to accept the fact that there are some cases where we can't make a difference. But as for people who are facing difficult circumstances, our wish for them is may they act in skillful ways even, even in spite of the difficulties, because in the long run it's going to be for their well-being, even if it requires sacrifices. There was an interesting and very inspiring story recently in The Guardian about a couple in Iran whose son had been killed. And the, the murderer had been found and brought to trial and found guilty. And according to Islamic law, apparently, the parents of the, the boy had the decision as to whether to forgive him or not. They wanted to get the revenge, the execution would go ahead. If not, then it would stop. The murderer would be set free. And both parents were set on seeing the execution through. Until a few days before the, the actual execution, the mother had a dream of the son coming to her and pleading with her, don't go for revenge, please forgive the guy. And she woke up and she didn't want to have that dream. She wished she hadn't, hadn't had that dream. It bothered her. She couldn't face the idea of forgiveness. The dream happened a second time. And so finally on the day of the execution she went up slap the murderer and then remove the noose from his head. So he was set free. And afterwards she, she was interviewed and she said she now felt a huge sense of peace had overcome her as a result of that decision. That's the kind of thing we wish for, that people will act skillfully. And if there's anything we can do to help, we're happy to do it. Of course, one of the best ways we can help other people act skillfully is if we act skillfully ourselves. This means very, being very scrupulous in our behavior, not only in our interactions with other people, but also in the interactions in our mind. 
is what kind of tendencies are you developing as you're sitting here with your eyes closed, or as you're off just being by yourself, not doing formal meditation. Where does your mind go then? What kind of ruts are you creating in the mind? They may seem harmless at first, but over time they get deeper and deeper, and they actually will start influencing your behavior. So being very scrupulous with yourself. Thoughts, words, and deeds. This is a real expression of goodwill. So remember, it's not just a soft, pink cloud kind of feeling. It's a very demanding, a very demanding wish, a very demanding attitude. This is why it's called a Brahma attitude. It's not your normal human attitude. Our goodwill usually is partial. There are certain people we feel goodwill for, and others we don't feel any goodwill for at all. And we often feel justified in our choice. But the Buddha is asking us to do something radical, goodwill for everybody, regardless. And it's our protection. It protects us from our own potential for doing unskillful things in the future. And when you remember this image of the lump of salt in the, the river of water, if you can make your mind expansive now, then whatever past bad karma you have, your development of goodwill is going to reduce the impact it has, or it could have in creating pain. So it's your protection in all directions, in the direction of the past and the direction of the future. It's your protection right now. And we're not speaking just in metaphorical terms. It really does protect you. As long as you're serious and careful and thoughtful, scrupulous and carrying it through. 